U.S. stocks and the U.S. dollar firmed in the first day of trading after the assassination attempt on U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump. China's GDP growth was below expectations and there's more downbeat data on New Zealand's economy. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in part two of our bonus deep dive interview on China's third plenum, ANZ chief economist for Greater China, Raymond Yun, explores what the key meeting could mean for the private sector. Every 10 or 20 years, the supreme leader blessing to the private sector has been a key pillar for China to develop and became a China miracle. But first in 5 and 5 with ANZ, US stocks rose and the dollar firmed as traders increased their bets that former President Donald Trump would win November's election. The S&P 500 was up 0.3% at 4am Sydney Melbourne time, buoyed by stocks expected to perform better under a Trump presidency, while the yields on longer-dated US Treasuries edged up on expectations for expansionary fiscal policy. ANZ head of G3 Economics, Brian Martin, says the 2016 experience was that a Trump presidency was positive for the US dollar and stocks and led to higher bond yields. Meanwhile, Brian says the market reaction to the assassination attempt has not materially affected pricing for when the Fed will first cut rates. The expectation now is just over 90% that the FOMC will cut interest rates 25 basis points in September. We've had excellent inflation data during May and June and indeed improved inflation data in April. And the labour market is rebalancing. I think both those developments contributed to comments from Fed Chair Powell overnight that the FOMC is getting greater confidence that inflation is on a sustainable path to 2% based on the Q2 inflation data. The US dollar index was up 0.15% at 4am Sydney Melbourne time. The Aussie dollar down 0.38% at 67.57 US cents and the Kiwi down 0.7% at 60.75 US cents. Number two, China's GDP growth of 4.7% in the June quarter from a year ago was well below market expectations for around 5%. ANZ's chief economist for Greater China, Raymond Yung, says he still expects 4.9% for the full year, but the second half will need to be better. The second half outlook of China will continue to be very vulnerable. We know that the first half performance of China has been largely relying on exports. If there is a softening of the export from China or the global electronic supply chains, then the growth number would even be lower and that will present a difficulty for the government to achieve 5% growth. That's the official target set at the National People Congress at the beginning of the year. Number three, China's weak consumer spending was a major driver for that soft GDP result. Retail sales in the month of June rose just 2% from a year ago in nominal terms. That was below expectations for around 3.4%, down from 3.7% in May. Raymond reports hearing of employers cutting salaries in China. We also know that anecdotally, a lot of employers and companies are cutting staff, slashing their salary. Banking sector in particular uh, faced a very, very massive uh, large salary cut. So the household consumption outlook of China is still very challenging. Unless there is a major structural reform or revival of the property market or property price, it is very difficult to see a big rebound or recovery of uh, Chinese consumption in the near term. Number four, there was more downbeat news from the New Zealand economy yesterday. House prices fell 0.3% in seasonally adjusted terms in June from May in the Real Estate Institute figures on house sales and prices. Volumes fell 33%. The Business New Zealand BNZ PSI survey also fell sharply to record lows in June, the lowest outside of COVID lockdown months. Here's ANZ senior economist Miles Workman. What I'd say about the housing market data is that they are certainly looking softer than our forecast, softer than the Reserve Bank's forecast, and when you put it together with other recent survey data, the PMI, the PSI, our truckometer, job ads, our recent business and consumer surveys, as you can tell, this is a pretty lengthy list, right? So you put it all together and it certainly suggests that the economy is running at a much softer pace than the Reserve Bank have been expecting, and therefore all else equal, it just adds to these arguments that perhaps Perhaps the Reserve Bank will be able to ease monetary conditions a little bit earlier than they've been signalling recently. Number five, the slowdown in New Zealand's housing market was also noticeable in ANZ's card spending data for June. Here's ANZ Chief Economist for New Zealand, Sharon Zollner. 
Yes, yeah, so this pretty much a clean slate of negative numbers year on year and anything related to housing. So things like tile plastering insulation contractors, that's down 25% year on year. Spending architects and engineering and surveying is down 16%. So that's consistent with a very weak pipeline for residential growth, consistent with the weakness that we're seeing there. So anything related to housing directly, but also durables, you know, people tend are more likely to buy a car or a motorbike or a boat or whatever if their house price has gone up and they can sort of convince themselves that the house is buying it. Uh, That's pretty difficult to do at the moment with house prices flat to falling over most of New Zealand. Sharon Zolner there. Now, in part two of our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ's chief economist for Greater China, Raymond Yuing, explains why this week's third plenum meeting of China's key leaders is so important for the private sector. So how could the central government help those local governments, which until now have been quite dependent on property development? I think the past two or three years have seen a lot of development for the top authorities to coordinate different policy into one package. For example, I mentioned about the uh, housing sectors or the property downturn that has actually hurt local government uh, fiscal sustainability. But China want to use fiscal policy to boost the economy. So how would the central government coordinate housing policy and the fiscal policy is already one important important economic relationship at the micro level. And other one is how would the monetary policy to be accommodating uh, the fiscal policy because at the same time, the government also want to uh, manage the interest rate level. Now, with the higher uh, reliance on fiscal policy, how would Uh, the government manage the entire yield curve and gain back the interest rate uh, autonomy will also be very important because one aspect that the central bank also need to keep an eye on is the exchange rate. So if China want to focus on interest rate, then they have to let the exchange rate to be moving uh, flexibly. If the interest rate is too low or is too high, then the exchange rate uh, appreciate too much. That would also hurt exports. So there are a lot of different you know, elements within the overall policy toolbox that the government needs to juggle. So this third plenum, my expectation is to provide a very coherent economic uh, package so that uh, all the different policy will be working in tandem and work coherently. This is uh, hope, you know, uh, that the third plenum will be able to provide. Now, of course, this is just a wish list uh, by the market or by myself, but uh, whether that the, the government is able to provide this economic blueprint remains to be seen. And how might the private sector in China view this third plenum? Because, you know, one of the big themes of the last few years has been so-called common prosperity. And I wonder what they might be looking for from this third plenum? The relationship between the state and the private sector is very, very important. In the past few years, apparently we have seen a confidence issue you know, facing the private sector. They don't know, you know whether China has continued to be a good place to make money, to develop the business, to expand the market. At the local level, the uh, governments also really want to collaborate with the private sector, but there is always a problem for access to funding at the local level. The cost of funding for the private sector is apparently uh, higher than the state sectors. So that's uh, there are lots of different types of issues facing the private sector. So at the third plenum, one thing that we also wanted to see is to spell out clearly the role of the private sector in the overall economic development, which is always the case, uh, been the case, you know, in the last few third plenum. Every 10 or 20 years, the supreme leader blessing to the private sector has been a key pillar for China to develop and became uh, China miracle. Now, up to this point, what given what happened in the past few years with the growing state-owned sector, with the shrinking private sector, I think the top leadership really need to provide and assurance to the private sector that China remain a place for them to develop the business. Raymond Dune there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Tuesday, July the 16th. Catch you tomorrow with a preview of New Zealand's June quarter CPI data. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.